Okay. Um, can you hear me? Everything good? Uh, first of all, I want to thank Annette because that was a perfect introduction to my talk. Uh, <laughs> I want to go from there and look at uh, the question of how can we um, provide and ultimately synthesize archaeobotanical uh, evidence uh, for the theory. But uh, first, I want to uh, emphasize <coughs> the power of this theory because it strikes at the heart of the exchange between the Orient and the Occident in terms of knowledge, in terms of uh, um, ideas, technologies. And uh, it's relevant, as Marcos uh, pointed out, to some of the big questions of social and economic history. Um, uh, everything from uh, how the Islamic conquests impacted the common person to the topic of Mediterranean trade uh, and production. And in addition, from the perspective of agricultural science, tracing uh, crop diffusion and genetic histories can contribute ultimately to crop improvement. And we can now even exploit ancient DNA from archaeobotanical remains. Uh, but to do that, we need to know where to look uh, for useful specimens. And in this, I think Watson's theory can actually uh, be a guide if uh, all the available evidence is exploited. Um, so uh, the problem is that for all its significance, uh, Watson's thesis has been accepted without serious challenge, to quote historian Michael Decker. And uh, we heard some of that from Annette as well. Um, so to evaluate, reject, or refine the Islamic Green Revolution, it's necessary to reconstruct the paths and timing of diffusion for each crop on Watson's list, uh, region by region, uh, of the early Islamic <coughs> empires. And in this, archaeobotany has the pivotal role. And in what follows, I want to propose a methodology uh, for doing so. Um, so when I say, so uh, the main way that I want to do that is looking at archaeobotanical first finds and uh, un studying them for their uh, role in this theory. So when I say a first find, I mean the earliest instance of a species in the archaeobotanical record of a region. And this is uh, different from a new introduction, which is when a species first becomes entrenched in the agriculture of a region. Uh, and that itself is not the same as an agricultural revolution, which is when the new crops and techniques not only become entrenched, but their long-term effect impacts society uh, at large. And also, my focus, geographical focus here, will be in the Levant, Bilad Hashem. Um, and the theory behind the methodology that I want to propose is uh, simple. First finds may indicate new introductions, but not necessarily. And new introductions may comprise an agricultural revolution, but not necessarily. So that being the case, first finds are a first step in identifying agricultural revolution. Watson did it with first finds from historical texts. Maybe he didn't look at all the texts he should have. Uh, but now it's time to do it with archaeobotanical first finds. Uh, now, I started thinking about how to interpret archaeobotanical first friends after a colleague, Oriya Michai, uh, a master's student at Professor Ehud Weiss's. Oh, you guys are. That's strange. OK. Uh, that's strange. We can change. Maybe. Wait. Push the. No, wait. Yes. Oh, whatever. We can be uh, <laughs> clear about it. Whatever. Uh, so she. Um, <coughs> so she found uh, several first finds for archaeobotany, uh, for archaeobotany of the Levant in an assemblage. Uh, from uh, an, an Abbasid era assemblage in Jerusalem. And we were sure that at least one of them was a new introduction for the Islamic period. But how could we prove it? Uh, if, evidence, if absence of evidence is not evidence of absence, how can we ever uh, be sure that we have a new introduction in hand? Uh, so to overcome that problem, I came up with five criteria um, that uh, some of them will be familiar from uh, Annette's talk. And actually, I think a lot of the times, archaeobotanists and archaeologists in general use them instinctively. But as far as I know, they've never been laid out in a systematic methodology. 
So this is my contribution to critically evaluating the Islamic Korean Revolution. And I really hope you'll have challenging questions and comments uh, during the discussion slot uh, for me. So this is my five point checklist. Uh, and before I go through them, um, I just want to say that each, uh, each point is a necessary uh, criterion. So a problem in any one of these would undermine the interpretation of the first find as a new introduction. So uh, criterion number one, taphonomy. Taphonomy must be ruled out as an explanation for the plant remains first find status. Um, taphonomy refers to the processes that uh, or undergo an organism, in this case a plant remain, after its death. And, uh, you know, if we had um, um, So uh, if we had a case of unique preservation, and that's our first find, then we would uh, question whether the first find is due to unique preservation or uh, actually being a new introduction. So uh, to overcome that, if we find uh, um, other examples of that species preserved in later contexts under normal preservation conditions, then that would be good. Or if we found close taxonomic relatives in earlier uh, assemblages, that would also overcome that issue. Um, criteria number two: sampling and discovery, uh, discovery of uh, and recovery. Sorry, discovery of the first find in question must not be attributable to superior sampling and recovery strategies. Uh, so you know, small seeds are often uh, missed in the coarse sieves of archaeologists and may not be uh, identified. So um, uh, so it's important to have uh, archaeobotanical assemblages for comparison that, uh, um, that have been uh, systematically sifted for plant remains. And if your site is the first uh, of the region in which that's done, you're going to have a lot of first finds, but they're not necessarily going to be new introductions. Uh, identification and dating. Uh, absence in earlier assemblages must not be due to the lack of taxonomic resolution of identification. Criterion number three, and this is uh, sometimes the first thing that needs to be done is that you have an adequate reference collection uh, to securely identify the finds. This is our reference collection uh, with Professor A. Weiss and Dr. Yon Malamed in Bailan. And this reference collection is geared specifically towards the Southern Levant with basically full coverage. And also, dating needs to be secure. Uh, criteria number four, geographic significance. Um, this involves uh, defining the geographic region broadly enough so that it uh, has meaning. You know, if I say, for the first time, I found, a, uh, uh, I don't know what, hard wheat in Catalonia, uh, maybe that's not, or in Barcelona itself, then that's not so significant. Maybe you need to. Uh, look beyond. And uh, not only, so in my case, it would be the Levant, which is a broad enough geographical region, but it's also important to take into account neighboring regions as well, and also uh, to infer the direction of diffusion. Uh, you know, so if we're talking about an east west diffusion, and we found uh, an earlier example of the crop westward of the Levant, then that would rule out the possibility of a new introduction in the Levant at that time. Uh, criteria number five, uh, there needs to exist a, a sufficiently large database for comparison over the long term and over other, over relevant geographic <coughs> regions for comparison. Um, this is a work in progress, but to date there's dozens of archaeobotanical assemblages that have been studied from the pre-Islamic period in the Levant, from Roman Byzantine periods, so it's enough to start to synthesize and compare. compare. Uh, results from early Islamic times. So to apply this methodology, I'm using the Givati assemblage as a test case. Uh, it used to be a parking lot in the old city of Jerusalem, and now it's an archaeological site. Uh, this is Oriyam Chai, who worked on the archaeobotanical remains, and this is uh, a cesspit from uh, the site, which is one of the uh, unique features of the site, which I mentioned was also was excavated by Doron Ben-Ami of the Israel Antiquities Authority. The site is unique in several ways. It's an Abbasid era uh, archaeobotanical assemblage, which is very rare uh, in the Levant. It's 
archaeologically identified as a marketplace, uh, and its main feature are cesspits and refuse pits, uh, which archaeologically is also extremely rare in, in our region. Uh, and well, it's pretty much whole-scale preservation by mineralization of archaeobotanical remains, which is also unprecedented. <coughs> And here in the picture on the left is the archaeobotanical remain, and on the right is modern apple seeds. Uh, so you can see the quality of the preservation, uh, but the type of preservation is uh, very rare for an entire assemblage in the Levant. And perhaps owing to these uh, unique circ uh, circumstances of context and preservation, Several rare species were found, including four first finds for Levantine archaeobotany. And these are those first finds, the aubergine, black mulberry, radish, and the wild species clammy plantain. And I'm going to go through them one by one, looking at the methodological criteria that I laid out before. Uh, so the research question is, do these first finds from the Givati assemblage represent new introductions into the Levant? Or is their first find status due to unique conditions of preservation and context? So uh, to start with the aubergine, uh, taphonomically speaking, earlier finds of the Solanum genus have been found in the Levant, suggesting that uh, preservation isn't an issue. The aubergine should also have been found had it been there. Uh, sampling and recovery, the seeds are rather, say, medium size for archaeobotanical remains, about three millimeters in diameter. So it would have been noticeable in most archaeobotanical assemblages. Uh, identification is secure, diagnostic. It's, uh, all the contexts from Givadi are securely abbasid, so no issue there. And geographically, we're looking at an East Asian center of domestication, uh, so that fits in with the East-West uh, diffusion uh, of Watson's theory. And in our database uh, to date of dozens of Roman Byzantine sites, there are no previous uh, um, uh, aubergine finds, whether in the Levant or west of it, as far as I'm aware. So, archaeobotanically, it's a good candidate for new introduction status. The mo black mulberry is not so simple. Uh, first of all, taphonomically uh, speaking, there may be limited opportunities for archaeobotanical, for archaeological deposition. It has a short growing season. Fruits don't preserve well, not usually cooked. So it may not make it to the site in the first place. Not enough to rule out, but it raises questions. In terms of sampling and recovery, the seeds are large enough, so that's not an issue. Has indicative morphology to the extent that we can distinguish between black and white mulberry, which is important because the, the black mulberry has grown for millennia in Persia, but the white mulberry is a candidate for East Asian Islamic introduction in the Islamic period, even though Watson didn't mention that but it may be part of a early Islamic textile revolution. Uh, and the kicker here is the database for comparison. There is one <coughs> previous find of black mulberry from Egypt, so no new introduction there. Radish, uh, taphonomically speaking, not an issue. Wild radishes are common in Levantine archaeobotanical assemblages. Sampling and recovery seeds are the same size, so they should be seen, uh, should be found. Uh, Identification and dating, we know how to distinguish, uh, identify them, no problem. But geographically speaking, uh, wild progenitors of radish are extant in the Levant, and genomic studies suggest independent domestication in Europe and Asia. So there's no reason to assume that radish would have been uh, introduced from abroad. Uh, and in our database, we find earlier finds from Egypt. So that's also a no-go. Uh, clammy plantain, uh, wild, taphonomically speaking, we find its relatives, not a problem. Sampling and recovery is okay, pretty, uh, again, same size as the others. Uh, however, plantago afra, clammy plantain types, were previously identified in prehistoric sites. So although not definitively identified, it suggests that uh, perhaps due to, that they were, may have been there. Uh, so that's enough to, to cause an issue. And geographically speaking, it is a common wild plant in the Levant, so there's no reason why it would be a new introduction. And the kicker is that since the Givati ex excavations, another much earlier instance of Tantagoafer was found in Yoram's cave uh, in Israel. So it's no longer 
It was a first for Levantine archaeobotany, but no longer the earliest, so that's out. And to summarize uh, these results using historical sources, the aubergine is a good archaeobotanical uh, candidate, and historical sources agree with that um, early Islamic introduction. Black mulberry, not an archaeobotanical candidate, and historical sources also suggest that it reached the Levant much earlier, at least in Hellenistic mm -hmm. times. Radish, not an archaeopanthanical candidate, and it's mentioned in earlier historical uh, sources. And the same goes for clammy plantain. So to wrap this up and go back to the theory, uh, recall the relationship between first finds, new introductions, and agricultural revolution. Uh, so here we've, we've shown that first finds are not necessarily new introductions. Of four first finds, only one uh, was the aubergine. And uh, we think it was an early Islamic introduction. But more importantly, the methodological criteria uh, proposed here can help us identify new introductions. And this is important because identifying new introductions from archaeobotanical first finds is a necessary first step in evaluating the Islamic Green Revolution. So that will help us in the future, I hope, uh, to chart the diffusion of the crops relevant to the Islamic Green Revolution, crop by crop, and region by region. And once we have that regional, uh, multi-regional uh, map of diffusion, it won't only help us evaluate the Islamic Green Revolution, but will also help us advance uh, research in archaeobotany, archaeogenetics, and maybe even uh, crop science. So I want to acknowledge all those who helped make this presentation possible, and thank you for listening. <laughs>